This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point, with me, Liu Xin. In the next 30 minutes, I will dissect China-related stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my panel to bring you the missing pieces of the China puzzle. So join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email us at the point with Alex at cgtn.com. Let me know what you're thinking. We start our live streaming every Friday at 10.30 a.m. Beijing time, so do get in touch with us and we might just read your comments on the show. As usual, before we start on today's story, let me share one thoughtful message we've received about the coverage of the Hong Kong protests, which was the subject of our program last week. Now, this is a message, message from one of our Indian viewers, and it says, let's remember that uh, we as two nations in Asia, India and China, we can't reach out to full potential at the moment together as neighbors because of the UK and the US, which is sickening, frustrating and very sad. The problems that our two countries face of division and separation, etc., is because of the UK initially and now being carried on by their bigger brother, the United States. Now, many of the local people in my country, like me, want a united Asia to, among other things, put colonialism to death. So, since I'm a South Asian person, I yearn for South Asia, East Asia cooperation to be amplified to bring about the unity amongst our people. Ultimately, this will play a role in blasting the hegemonic media of the West and countering it in addition to other countermeasures that we can use as well. A big thank you to this viewer for offering your observation and thoughts with us. I couldn't agree with you more that a united Asian voice is needed to blast the hegemonic media coverage of the West. That's why we're doing this right now. And we do hope that more friends from around the world can come and visit China or India or other Asian countries to form their own experience and opinions. Now, let's move on to today's story, China's facial recognition. And, of course, I'm going to start by having my face scanned right here. Okay, I think that's enough. Facial recognition has been used widely across China, powering the technology to unlock phones, to pass security checks at airports. There you go. Does it look like me? And purchase goods with a smile-to-pay function. At its core, it is a biometric software application capable of verifying or identifying a person by comparing and analyzing patterns of facial images. Besides being convenient, facial recognition technology does have another major advantage, safety and security. As Forbes reports, law enforcement agencies use the technology to uncover criminals and to find missing children. In New York, for instance, police were able to apprehend an accused rapist using facial recognition technology within 24 hours of an incident where he threatened a woman with rape at knife point. In cities where police don't have time to fight petty crime, business owners are installing facial recognition systems to identify subjects of interest when they come into their stores. And airports are increasingly adding facial recognition recognition technology to security checkpoints. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security predicts that it will be used on 97 percent of travelers by 2023. However, it does trigger concerns about data privacy and such concerns have not gone unnoticed by technology experts and government officials in China. The personal information security specification took effect in May 2018. It lays out granular guidelines for consent and how personal data should be collected, used and shared. 
while the 2017 cybersecurity law is currently the most authoritative law protecting personal information among other functions, the specification is the effective centerpiece of an emerging system around personal data. In June this year, a professional committee under China's Ministry of Science and Technology issued principles of next generation artificial intelligence governance, pledging to develop a responsible AI in China. Although a more complete and improved regulation system is being shaped, the establishment of the national level working group to set the standard for facial recognition in China is a giant step in the right direction. But instead of dis discussing the pros and cons of this technology, some media seem to intentionally ignore China's efforts to regulate data collection. They open fire on the Chinese government with full ammunition, with uh, false accusations and cast aspersions on how China will use these technological developments. Let me start with this article from CNN Business with a headline, China is rolling out facial recognition for all new mobile phone numbers. It doesn't take long for the article to begin questioning the use of China's new facial recognition technology. The fourth line of the article reads, while the government says the implementation of biometric data effectively protects citizens' legitimate rights and interests in cyberspace and helps fight fraud, the move brings with it considerable privacy and security concerns in one of the most tightly controlled online environments in the world. The move brings with it considerable privacy and security concerns. According to who, you might ask? The journalist provides two unsatisfactory pieces of evidence to back up their statement. The first quote, four Chinese researchers specializing in AI to back up their spurious claim of security concerns. The article links to a paper authored by four Chinese academics from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. So far so good, however, what the article fails to articulate is that the research paper actually details the many benefits of facial recognition and similar technologies and highlights the advantages for the public good. Also, the research paper does not argue against facial recognition per se, but rather the possible ramifications if the data is not fully secure and risks falling into the wrong hands. Secondly, the article quotes the US-based Electronic Frontier Foundation, a non-profit organization which focuses on, quote, civil liberties in a digital world. Why does the journalist once again assume that a US or Western value framework is applicable to China in the broadest sense? We have our own politics, our own ideological uh, framework and our own way of doing things. When will this imposition, this assumption of the Western way of being the only way end? The article goes on to say China's largest policy also raises alarms because of how it could potentially be used by the country's vast surveillance state. Now, there are two problems here. First, who is this raising an alarm with? Those in the U.S.? To which I would respectfully say you have no cause to be alarmed on behalf of the Chinese people. Secondly, I would question the term surveillance state. London is reported to have over half a million CCTV cameras to keep its citizens safe, with over 15,000 in operation on the tube alone. Is London a surveillance city, or the underground a surveillance tube, or are these just measures that uh, national governments, local authorities, businesses and private citizens take to ensure the safety and the protection of the public or themselves? It was also reported this week that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security wants to use facial recognition technology at airports to monitor people traveling to and leaving that country. This would also include U.S. citizens. So quite some double standards here, wouldn't you agree? Now let's take a look at a second article. This one was published in the Daily Mail and the headline reads, China starts selling its world-leading surveillance and facial recognition technology globally despite concerns it violates human rights i'm sorry this 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 story really, <laughs> really makes me laugh a little bit and you'll see why i find it so funny 
Because I'm not sure what or who the headline is trying to criticize here. Is it aimed at China for selling the technology it has developed or those who are looking to purchase it? Why is, it, why is China attacked for choosing to market its technological innovations, which have a myriad of uses, and it's not simply a tool to violate human rights? If the paper has a problem with other countries using this technology, why doesn't it call them out? Instead, it calls out China, making us look bad and seems to want to hold us accountable for the actions of other countries. The piece goes on to say, and here's the really funny part, in contrast to the typical weapons and ammunition on display on other stands, Chinese firms offered non-lethal equipment, non-lethal, helmets, bulletproof vests, and tactical clothing for special forces or riot troops, jamming equipment, and cameras, lots of cameras. Now this paragraph is about a recent Millipool security trade fair in France. The journalist here admits that China is selling non-lethal products while others at the trade fair were selling and promoting deadly weapons. Yet China is still painted as the boogeyman, the one everyone should be afraid of. China is a world leader in these digital technologies, but the United States and the UK, let's not be mistaken, are the two largest producers and sellers of arms. These include bombs, bullets, and fighter jets. I only ask, which would you rather see deployed on your streets to keep your, your citizens safe, cameras or guns? It seems that some people think that having a society plagued by lethal weapons is a preferable alternative to China. Every country has its own way of organizing society and controlling crime and unrest, and China chooses cameras over deadly machines. Is there something wrong with that? And finally, let's take a look at this article published in the Financial Times, and the first thing that struck me about this piece was the choice of the picture. The journalist or editor has chosen a picture not of a Chinese person, but of an African. The piece goes on to suggest that China is trying to somehow impose questionable standards onto other countries. Here we can see once again, with the tone and choice of picture, how the international press, or some in the international press, try and frame China as the enemy in opposition to and attempting to control the rest of the world with cameras. The title of this article is Chinese Tech Groups Shaping UN Facial Recognition Standards. The article claims that China is shaping new facial recognition and surveillance standards at the United Nations according to leaked documents. However, no further details were given about these mysterious documents. Should journalists be able to make such accusations without offering evidence to verify their claims? Not in my humble opinion. The article goes on to explain that what uh, Chinese companies are doing is, quote, proposing new international standards to the International Telecommunication Union. So what Chinese companies, not the government, are actually doing is making suggestions to the ITU which they can then choose to adopt or dismiss. There is no imposition, no Chinese mandate which somehow automatically becomes the global rule of law. And as a leader in facial recognition technology, is China not well placed to make suggestions to this UN body? Once again, we see an attitude of doubt, of pessimism over logic prevailing here. The article goes on to highlight how many of the 200 member states of the ITU go on to adopt these regulations, especially those in Africa, the Middle East and Asia. Europe and the US tend to develop their own independent policies, but nobody is forcing countries to adopt these measures. So why the smear campaign? It sometimes seems like China can't do anything right in the eyes of many in the international press. That's all the articles for this week. Join me after the short break when I'll be taking a closer look at this week's stories and uh, hear from my panel of guests. They will be coming from Stansbury, China, Beijing Normal University and Tsinghua University. But do stick around. Some interesting stuff right after this short break. I want to see you after the break. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin, and thanks for sticking around. I have with me three panel panelists who will be sharing their thoughts and their opinions on facial recognition issues, especially when it comes to China. They include James Early, CEO of Stansbury China, Professor Zhang Fan, Associate Professor from Beijing Normal University, and uh, Rick Dunham, co-director of Global Business Journalism Program of Tsinghua University. Gentlemen, welcome to Headline Buster. I want to have your thoughts on what I said just now. Rick, why don't we start with you? Well, sir, I disagree with almost everything that you said. Okay. Start with the CNN article. I thought that the CNN article was uh, fair. There were a few lines I would have written a little bit differently. Uh, I think if there was any skepticism, it was what is broadly an American skepticism about uh, using uh, what would be called big brother technology, whether it's facial recognition, AI, uh, in non-criminal cases. Uh, and I think that that is uh, not anti-China, it's that there's a different sense of privacy. And I agree with you on that. There are cultural differences that should not be imposed on other cultures, but I think that that, that story reflected uh, American culture and not a bias against China. I think that the Daily Mail story uh, was biased and the uh, Financial, Times? Financial Times article was pretty good uh, and, and I don't think, I, I, I think that it had a photograph of Africa because it was, the story itself was basically about uh, the uh, reach of facial recognition technology in Africa and the sales of facial recognition, uh, racial facial recognition technology. My quibble with that story was that there was a line in there that said that uh, either Chinese government or Chinese companies are testing in Africa facial recognition of uh, dark-skinned people. And that was just an assertion. Uh, there, was not, there, was not, there was not any evidence to back it up. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 think that, I think that it's a very important debate to have, but I don't think we should assume that Western coverage with skepticism about uh, facial recognition technology for privacy reasons means anti-China. There is anti-China uh, coverage uh, from, from time to time, but I think you have to separate them out. Okay. Any other opinion from our two other panelists? Uh, Professor well, Zhang. Yeah, well, it depends on whether you, you actually go through all the, all the stories about facial recognition and say how many of them are actually against China, uh, talking about China, because China is not the first one. Facial recognition is invented with support from an intelligence agency. That's not the Chinese intelligence agency, let's say that. And also, the Chinese companies are not the first to sell them. And for some reason, when you see these stories, it's always China. I mean, it's not necessarily purposely against China, but you, you talk about Big Brother, you talk about 1984. That's what people, when people have a narrative they want to push against China, that's the perfect thing to do, right? Because China is what well, the original author was anti-communist, and China is also the country that came out with bureaucracy. So you can see you can see people if, for people who've never been to China, it's sort of a natural thing for them to to imagine. Um, so this kind of story is is heavily concentrating on China. So I don't fully agree with what you said. Maybe um, that particular yeah. story itself that we dissected probably is not targeting China, but overall we do see quite amount of press coverage on China, especially, and, and critical of China's practices on facial and recognition. And I think we'll see more, and I think we'll see more about, I mean, this is a great topic, and I think a great discussion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and it's not just about facial recognition. It's going to be about gate recognition, about this yeah. data profile, not just about these three stories. This is just the beginning of an ongoing thing. I took a DD here this morning, and it said, your driver's identity has been confirmed by facial recognition. I felt safer, right? It's just like an ID card, but better. That's one use, and I think probably everyone is okay with that. I want to catch criminals too. I don't want some you know, pedophile or rapist running around my neighborhood when we could have caught him with a camera. Mm -hmm. I think where we get into the, the gray area, at least with the American value system, and by the way, Americans complain about, you know, we have the, the Snowden situation, we have you know, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. We have data privacy concerns as well, and, 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 and grievances, uh, but there's a line to be drawn between uh, protection from criminal acts and, let's say, you know, someone who has a different opinion in a political sense, and that could be in China, that could be in Africa, that could be in some regime. Take it to an extreme case. You might have some, you know, a crazy dictator in some small country who wants to oppress his opponents. 
facial recognition is a very powerful tool. And we've seen data gives people a lot of power quickly. It's mm -hmm. like a fast, fast car. Mm -hmm. Not just facial recognition, just all this technology. So it's, it's good that we're having these kinds of discussions. I was good to see, glad to see the Chinese Ministry of Education take a step back and say, wait, we were using facial, facial recognition in classrooms to test if students are paying attention or not. But they're, they're, this can be inaccurate, so we're going to take a step back and, and decide a more clear policy. So I think, I think that's the way we should all be looking at this. Um, I'm not sure because I saw the story where the students were wearing some kind of device, but that's very, also very controversial within the Chinese society as well. There is a lot of uh, criticism of that. And it's I'm, good there's controversy. Yeah, so um, I think it is also an issue here in China whether our privacy is being infringed upon while security is being protected. But definitely it's not like, you know, in China everything is being controlled, everybody is being watched, what they say, what they write. I don't think it is in that case. And it's a, it's a price, of course, to pay pay when you have extra security. I think that is a fact that we all recognize as well because there, otherwise there is no, no way for anybody to be caught so, so easily. I was in New York, um, which is also, by the way, a city with a lot of cameras. Right. People don't mention it so much, but mm -hmm. there are cameras everywhere. And yet they're not so good because they're not able, when something happens, for instance, there was a car crash and the car just drove away and they're not able to find the, crim find the suspect because the technology is just not so good. So if they would have better recognition technology or better camera, they're probably able to protect their citizen, their residents a bit better. Correct. I, I think there is just about universal agreement on fighting crime. And I do believe, uh, in, in a lot of ways, the Chinese artificial intelligence, at least facial recognition technology, is ahead of the game. That's one of the reasons it's, so, it's, it's, it's had uh, such a penetration in Africa, uh, because it's, it's state of the art. Um, the question is something that is cultural for every country, which is where does privacy come in? Where does use of facial recognition for identification, but not for criminal intent, come in? Uh, I mean, I like the fact I, I go to museums in China. Facial recognition allows me to go in. It's my ticket. That's convenient. I mean, I was in Dongbei. It was great. It was fast. But where's the line? And, and, and I think in America, the courts have drawn the line on government collecting data on non-criminal activity, warehousing the data. Using that to let me in uh, is OK. But if there's a picture of me that then goes into a government database that says I was there at that time, that's where in America the law, the Constitution, would draw the line. It's up to every country to decide. I don't think I, I think that a lot of the coverage uh, globally of facial recognition has been the risks, the downside of government abuses. Um, that's sort of news. That, that good news is not news. But I do I do think a little more balance would be helpful there. Yeah. But again, it's a challenge for every country. Yeah, I think, I think balance is very important. A conversation, a fair and balanced uh, reporting uh, analysis is, is really important. But you sh people shouldn't masquerade their opinion pieces as factual reporting. And that, that draws the conclusion from the headline. And then, and then there's no conversation. And then you already killed the topic. Uh, but in reality, the, uh, for the security thing, like when a lot of more modern conveniences uh, have security risks. And to credit prevent cards that, too. Credit cards yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, to prevent that, the easiest thing is to actually be able to catch criminals doing that and very quickly. And, and facial recognition can do that, help, can do that. So at some stage, it's unavoidable that you're going to have to introduce these things. And then by delaying the conversation, by just, just wiping it under the carpet, and, 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 not fairly discussing mm. it is it's the worst okay. thing. Okay, let's in let's my sorry to interrupt just to have this uh, say from our uh, YouTube uh, watcher by this person by the name of Sunday. That technology isn't bad itself, but the way it is deployed by governments, and I think the fair point to say it's a challenge for every government. And somehow, when it comes to China, it's the the question mark is bigger. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, because again, as you said, as I said, the surveillance state in London, you know, in every in every major metropolis in in the world, you have a lot of cameras, and yet the finger pointing is heavily on China. Do you see it this way? When we bring in the Western value system, we talk about collateral damage, right? If, if the car were invented right now, or the gun were invented right now, I don't think that would, they would be legalized in the U.S. because we know guns save lives, but guns kill a lot of people too. We know facial recognition can catch criminals, but there's going to be 
uh, blowback, right? I mean, some, some Amazon product could identify a white male 99% of the time, but an African-American female only 60% of the time, right? So I wouldn't want to be that African-American female who's misidentified. And then there's data breaches, right? So there's collateral damage with all this. I think the issue, the debate is, where is the Chinese government going to draw the line as far as how much collateral damage is it willing to accept? Because mm. you're right, it's people want privacy, it's people want that protect, and it is looking at that. Mm. I think it's good that we're making, or that we're talking, and hopefully the government is going to make a clear and measured decision mm. and not just kind mm. of a grab ball. I think China also perceives a, 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 a threat in terms of uh, stability, in terms of uh, outside interference in its domestic affairs and also efforts to try to separate parts of China, efforts try to destabilize the Chinese government, efforts to subvert, uh, to bring subversion in parts of China. I think that is a different situation that many other countries, may, especially Western countries, don't face. They don't have that kind of uh, <laughs> challenges, you know, at their doorstep, basically coming from everywhere, especially at the situation we're looking at th at this moment. So, from my perspective, although I, under I, I, I understand there must be a line, but exactly where the line draws, because for one point, a country of 1.4 billion people, to keep it safe and to keep everybody secure, and then to keep the country together, when you have all of these challenges posing at you at the same time. I think it is a daunting challenge. So I, I, I wouldn't be one. I wouldn't want to be in the position of the Chinese government at this moment, Rick. What well, I, I see in a lot of the international coverage, China doesn't get the benefit of the doubt. No. You will have you will have the risk side without an equal explanation. But I, I would say, in one word, the, the main reason I don't think it is necessarily anti-China, but I think the situation in Xinjiang has really done that because. There's been so much Western coverage about the use of facial recognition and artificial intelligence to round people up that I think that that I think that's, that that's that is the perception. What, that, yeah, right, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that it is it has become the uh, the the background by which every story on facial recognition in China yeah. is judged. Yeah, uh, I'll come back to that. But this viewer by the name of uh, Jessica Liu, anything good about China is always dismissed as bad. Very often the case, I would say. <laughs> but maybe <Except> people, Alibaba. <laughs> <laughs> maybe people don't agree. Yeah, maybe some people don't agree. But in terms of Xinjiang, I understand it's a, it's, it's a, it's a um, point in focus where um, it has been accused of using facial recognition technology to uh, sur to surveil, to monitor the movements, for instance, of Muslims. Uh, I, I've seen that. But on the other hand, if you, I do not know exactly what's happening because I, ha I do not have insider information. I've never been to Xinjiang. But I understand the security situation in Xinjiang was also extremely bad. I mean, a lot of terrorist attacks took place, thousands basically, from 1990 to 2016. Not just Han people were killed, but also Uyghur people, Kazakh people, people from other ethnic groups. So there is also the, the need to step up security to be able to tra tra track what people who have criminal intentions or who have committed crimes are doing and whether they are about to inflict another uh, deadly attack on innocent people. So it's again two sides of the coin. I don't know whether the people in the, in the Western countries are getting the other side. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been to Xinjiang, I've been to Ulumuchi. Um, it's a beautiful place and it's a, it's a shame that all this is happening there. And I think it comes back to where we draw the line, right? Everybody is against terrorism. Everybody is, is horrified by that. But do you use technology? Do you use the police force to, to stop and then just go from there? Or, or, or is there, at least as the Western media would say, further suppression in the name of, officially in the name of preventing terrorism? Right? That, I think that's the parallel to how the West would be looking at AI. I would say it's not just facial recognition. It should be right. the topic is really AI applied to facial recognition. Okay, there was another comment, but I guess uh, when this shows up, that means we're running out of time. <laughs> time goes really fast. Uh, many thanks to my guest James Early from Stansbury, China, uh, Zhang Fan from Beijing Normal University, and uh, Rick Dunham from Tsinghua University. I wonder what you think of uh, my monologue and our discussion. So do write us. On, the, uh, on another note, I want to solicit some videos um, that you shoot with your cell phones if you think it is interesting and worth sharing just send them to me to the email address at the point with lx at cttn.com we'll 